Hello friends, my name is JJ, and one of my all-time favorite videos is this one I made in 2022 about the role played by accents in American pop culture. In it, we discuss the degree that a character's accent is often used as a kind of shorthand for communicating important information about that character's personality to the viewer. Often this is heavily bound up in long-standing stereotypes about the sort of people that have that accent in real life. But increasingly, a lot of pop culture accents have also become these more abstract things that we only recognize from pop culture, which is to say, independent as to whether or not we have ever heard these accents in the real world, entertainment media has taught us to recognize them as part of a larger system of pop culture symbology. Anyway, in that original video, I identified 10 specific accents as being the biggies, and they were the general American accent, which is what most Americans regard as normal, unaccented English. It is almost always used for main characters. Now, all we gotta do is lure these guys someplace, right? Try to cure them while they try to kill us and then send them home. Using a magic box. Well, that's the plan. You let them handcuff you? Wouldn't be much of a surrender if I resisted. The New York accent, which is used to communicate that a character is tough, aggressive, or a bit of a bully. Okay, wise guy. Where's the rabbit? I'm seen it. What's in there? My lingerie. <laughs> is your refrigerator running? Well, why, yes. Well, you better go and catch it. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest puddle of them all, Angel Fangs. The Atlantic Ocean. Technically, the Pacific is larger. Well, that goes without saying. The southern accent, which is mostly used to communicate the idea that a character is rural, hickish, and usually quite stupid. Not a Jerry I know. Took me to Merry Christmas. Which is a strip club. Merry Triple Xmas. Oh well, when I have a Chipotle blue cheese bacon burger at Bennigan's, I forget all about my dad being queer and my mom trying to kill me. I'm gonna be okay. Really? No, I'm Slim hard. Now, 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 save your sermon, preacher. It ain't Sunday, you know. But a more refined sort of southern accent can also be used to communicate the idea of a character who is regal and formal, though usually in a somewhat suspicious or sinister way. Look at all these little things. So busy now. Notice how each one is useful. What a lovely ballet ensues, so full of form and color. Then there is the ESL accent, which is to say the accent of a character who speaks broken English in some way, but not necessarily in a way that associates him with a specific foreign place. Characters who speak broken English in this way are usually portrayed as being clueless and dopey and often quite naive. for you. For me? He never yells for me. He yells at me, but only when I deserve it, which is often. <laughs> He's a great man. How many times must Rose porch himself? No strange visitors ever! Do not burn the candle at both ends, as it leads to the life of a hairdresser. Me know which shape me like best for cookies. Ha ha ha. Oh, tummy shape. The African-American accent, which when used for non-black characters, associates a character with stereotypically black personality traits, usually being cool. You dead beats are under arrest. It's a stone cold shame. Who's the host with the most? Mm -hmm. You are your handsome devil. Oh, you're terrible. The preppy New England accent, which is often used for characters who are intelligent, but also very snobby and usually rich. Uh, pardon me, old man, but the French onion soup is a bit off. Take it back or I'll rip you in half. Are we simpatico? Oh, absolutely, sir. I'm sorry, sir. You're very masterful with the help. Friendly, but never familiar. That's what Dad always said. The British accent, which in American media is also often used for characters who are snobby and intelligent, but also characters who are powerful and sinister. Since you are reluctant to provide us with the location of the rebel base, I have chosen to test this station's destructive power on your home planet of Alderaan. These people are traitors and must be made examples of. 
With all due respect, sir, I was not trained to murder the innocent. But you were trained to follow orders. Of course we will eat the mice, but only after we have exploited their labors. The Midwestern accent, which is popular for naive middle-class female characters. <gasps> A gift? How delightful! Oh, you won't like it. I'll, I'll take it back. Oh, don't be ridiculous! It's nothing, really. Oh, I'm sure it's delightful. I'm sure it's... Oh, it's beautiful! An utter warmer! It's wonderful! I just don't know what to do with you. You're getting very poor marks in school and the teachers are complaining that you aren't paying attention. Yeah. The California Valley Girl slash surfer dude accent, which is common for young characters who are supposed to be hip, but also kind of air-headed. And it's like, when I had this garden party for my father's birthday, right? I said RSVP because it was a sit-down dinner. But people came that, like, did not RSVP. So I was, like, totally bugging. Because I think Tony has a right to know, Stephanie. <laughs> no, ah, uh, Miranda, I do not like Tony. No, Jessica, don't chill Tony with me. Those aren't clues, Scoob. Those are just things you want. Like, why is a toilet brush a clue? Scooby dooby doo. Do -dooby -dooby -dooby. Just because you can sing it at Scoob doesn't make it a clue. It just makes it awesome. <laughs> and the Jewish New York woman accent, which is often used for female characters who are sort of bossy and naggy and overbearing. Oh, too bad. You know, when Laverne's son Ira got married, a professional photographer made such a lovely wedding album. Hmm. And Ira's bride looked so... Slim. I can't believe it took you so long to see the baby. I kept saying to Michael, when is Jerry going to see the baby? I was saying the same thing. Let's take a picture. Michael, get the camera. Uh, you don't have to take a picture. I don't know where it is. It's in the bottom drawer of our dresser. Hurry up! <laughs> He's such an idiot. You guys like that video a lot, and I feel like I did a pretty good job deconstructing this important aspect of American pop culture semiotics. But you guys were also quick to notice that there are a few other very important accents that I failed to mention. So today I thought it might be fun if we analyzed an additional 10 accents that play an equally important role in American pop culture. Okay, so the biggest accent that most of you said I missed is the so-called mid-Atlantic or transatlantic accent. This describes a very formal, proper way of speaking English that gets its name from the idea that it is sort of half American and half British. It is often said to be a very affected, somewhat unnatural accent that you don't hear much these days, but was historically encouraged by snobby anglophilic institutions on the east coast of the United States, like boarding schools, etiquette coaches, and acting classes. The actress Katherine Hepburn, who grew up in this sort of milieu and was known for playing very elegant, cold characters, is probably the person most associated with this accent. Hello. Fancy seeing you here. Orange juice? Certainly. Now tell me you've forsaken your beloved whiskey and whiskies. And as a result, accents like hers now tend to be used mostly to signal that a female character is very dignified and haughty. I really felt quite distressed at not receiving an invitation. You weren't wanted. Not what? Oh. oh dear, what an awkward situation. Human technology is not something to tamper with. <laughs> Have you lost your senses? This is human food. It can be very, very dangerous. The mid-Atlantic accent can be a bit challenging, though, because it often kind of drifts into the New England snob accent I mentioned earlier, particularly when it comes to men. Fraser from Fraser, for instance, I have heard described as having both a mid-Atlantic accent and a New England snob accent, both of which would be consistent with his character. As a matter of fact, I'm going to call the gentleman that I manhandled and, and apologized to him for not having worked out our dispute in, in the right way in the first place, through words. The key here is restraint. And I do hope you'll follow my lead, Becky with the nail gun. 
Right. Another one that evolves out of this larger cultural geographic tradition is a certain sort of fast-talking, old-timey accent. It combines elements of New England accents with the quick talking, sort of phony sounding way that actors used to speak in old black and white movies. It is now most often used to just signify a character who is sort of old fashioned in some way. I recently became aware of that creepy Muppet themed ARG welcome home and the shopkeeper character in that has this sort of accent. Howdy do fellas, can't let me share my wares. In the classic Simpsons episode, where Homer becomes the Beer Baron, the special investigator who is dispatched to Springfield speaks this way as well, to emphasize how out of touch he is. I'm happy to report that the flow of illegal liquor seems to have dried up. Public drunkenness has ceased, and those mysterious liquor clouds over Evergreen Terrace are gone. The YouTuber Brentel Floss, who makes novelty songs about video games, has a song about Bioshock that he sings in this accent in order to capture that game's old-timey vibe. So glad you came on down to the best little town at the bottom of the deep blue sea. Okay, so the role of specifically foreign accents in American pop culture can be a bit tricky because obviously the main reason a character would have an accent from a particular foreign land is just to communicate the idea that he is from that place. So for example, a Pooh on The Simpsons has an Indian accent because he is an immigrant from India. For the next five minutes, I'm going to party like it's on sale for $19.99. But there are some specifically foreign accents that signal more than just the character comes from that country. The best example would probably be the German accent, which is often used for characters who are mad scientists. I'm here to study you, to understand what you are, why. You are, and I will get results. Doctor, what is the timeline on our own firewall disruptor? All goes according to plan, as always, mein Gras and Bitter. <laughs> anyway, that's how I lost my medical license. <laughs> this sort of thing is obviously a lingering legacy of the reputation that Germans earned during the Second World War for being sinister and sadistic, as well as cold and cruel in their sadism. The upside for Germany, however, is that the many German intellectuals and scientists who fled to America during the war also helped establish an association between the German accent and intelligence. But before my program is over, you're all going to know how to use your head for something beside a hat rack. Now for one of my famous bedtime symposiums. In this era of lies, we must remember there are no two versions of the truth, yeah? And the truth... Wait a minute. Is this a new bed? Doofenshmirtz on Phineas and Ferb and Dexter on Dexter's Lab are kind of indirect examples because their accents aren't German, but still play into this idea that super intelligent scientists should always sound at least vaguely European. And for the more factoring in, the survey of the other kids in the neighborhood averaged into the statistics of allowance rates not only here in this country, but all over the world. I should be making $1.5 million weekly. Hmm. Can't argue with the facts. See, the shrink and date array is for the shrinking, the cardboard box is for holding the shrunken treasures, and the bicarbonate of soda is for my motion sickness. Spanish accents carry all sorts of associations independent of coming from a Spanish-speaking country. A Spanish-accented character will usually be portrayed as very slick and charismatic, often in a somewhat unjustifiably cocky way. Puss in Boots in the Shrek series is a classic example. Now ye auger, pray for mercy from Puss in Boots. Latino accents are also a popular choice when you want to depict a character as being a real ladies' man or very romantically forward in some way. Bonita Juanita, I camped out all night waiting for you. I even pitched a tent. Keeping with the camping thing, I long to toast my marshmallows of passion over the fire of our love. You see, I'm your doctor of love, Fernando Martinez. Except I do not go to medical school. Fernando knows many languages, but I mostly know the language of love. French accents are often used for similarly seductive ladies' man type characters, but 
I feel they're becoming less common as time goes on, and the stereotype of the French romantic becomes a less pronounced part of American culture. Marge, do you know how beautiful you look in the moonlight? Oh, Jacques, I'm a married woman. I know, I know. My mind says stop, but my heart and my hips cry proceed. Instead, I feel like French accents these days are now primarily used for snobby waiter or chef type characters. This is not so! For I, Gustave Le Grand, do challenge your crude cake to a duel of delectable delicacies against my exceptionally oh! exquisite eclairs! Bonjour, sir was blinking at me. Is this because your date is a freak? No. Very good then. Bon appetit. Which is in turn archaic in its own way, given that French restaurants aren't exactly the most common real world thing in American culture anymore either. But that's the story of accents in American pop culture in general. They persist because they are useful shortcuts from a world building or narrative perspective, not because they necessarily reflect reality. Speaking of stereotypes, another one that you guys said I needed to include is a relatively controversial one, the gay accent. So as a gay myself, I can definitely say that there is a distinctive way that some gay men speak, and it is a somewhat contentious thing within the gay community. Some find it an obnoxious affectation of people who make being gay too much of their personality, while others say it is just how some men will naturally talk when liberated from traditional gender expectations. In any case, many works of pop culture have traditionally given effeminate, sort of sing-songy accents to characters who are supposed to be gay or at least sexually ambiguous. The character of Jack on Will and Grace, easily one of the most famous gay men in the history of television, is a pretty clear example. My God, Karen, you have no idea how hard it is for Will. I mean, poof, Grace changes the rules and they're not stuck at the hip anymore. I mean, it's so hard. <laughs> Big Gay Al in South Park speaks this way as well, in order to really max him out on every possible gay stereotype. Do you have lots of gay dogs here? We have all sorts of gay animals here at Big Gay Al. Over here we have a gay lion. Roar. And we have gay water buffalo, gay hummingbirds. Here's a gaggle of gay gooses. Hi fellas, it's so super to see you. This is kind of an obscure one, but I remember there was a genie character in one episode of Rocco's Modern Life that had this accent too. I've got to get cleaned up. Did someone say clean? Who are you? I'm clean Jean, the hygiene machine. I can help you with your problem dirt. And you do have a dirt problem. Let's hose you. Cupid in Fairly Odd Parents speaks this way, which I always thought was a kind of fun subversion for a character who embodies romance while also being a little bit edgy for a kid's show. Sir, the cherubs have lost the love. Launch the Thunder Hearts! Divert all emergency energy to my coffee machine and find me the dope who is responsible for this latte! It's fabulous! Now, the gay voice might not really be an accent per se, given it's not rooted in geography, the way that most accents are, but it definitely functions as a pop culture accent of the sort we're talking about today, in the sense that it is an identifiable speech style used in the media to communicate a specific identity. In that sense, we could perhaps compare it to the American nerd accent, which is that super nasally or lispy style of speaking, often given to really dorky characters to express just how dorky they are. Hey, George! George R.R. R. Martin! George! When's the next book gonna be finished? Will it be finished today? Say today! Is Jon Snow's mom really Melisandre? It makes perfect sense if you think about it. All right, switching gears a bit, how about the pirate accent? Obviously, it is most commonly used for pirate characters. By my congealed blood, you'll learn to love me. Sail with me, and I'll make you queen of the dead. And their vessel was swept to the bottom of the briny deep, swallowed whole by the treacherous, unforgiving sea. They sank, I guess, would be the, the one thing to take away from this part of the seminar. <laughs> But you do also see it used once in a while just for a sort of gruff type character, like Mr. Krabs in Spongebob. Some would try and take advantage of this situation by selling them toys or candy. But I sleep well at night with the knowledge that I'm providing them with something they need. 
a nutritious meal. Come here, you little piggies! Or Hagrid in Harry Potter. He's going to the finest school of witchcraft and wizardry in the world, and he will be under the finest headmaster that Hogwarts has ever seen, Albus Dumbledore. The Hagrid example is revealing because in the UK, this way of talking is just a normal regional accent. So how did it become associated with pirates? Well, the backstory is pretty interesting. Treasure Island was a very popular pirate movie released in 1950 and it starred the British actor Robert Newton as Long John Silver. Sometimes them what quotes the Bible has less Bible in their hearts than them what don't. But I can say one thing, Pari lad. I admire your honesty. <laughs> and thanks to the popularity of that film, after it came out, Anyone who wanted to do an impression of a pirate would just do an impression of Robert Newton. It's sort of like how when people do a vampire accent, they are actually doing an impression of Bela Lugosi. I bid you welcome. And in both cases, the accent has survived in the popular imagination long after memories of the original actor have faded. Anyway, Robert Newton was from southwestern England, and as a result, he spoke with what I believe the Brits call a West Country accent, which is how millions of perfectly ordinary, non-pirate British people speak every day. For example, on the YouTube channel Eat Sleep Dream English, I found the following clip of British pseudo-celebrity Josie Gibson, who comes from southwestern England, and she has what I think a lot of us over here would recognize as a pirate accent, which can sound a little bit jarring when it is coming from an attractive young woman. Are you still in touch at all? Oh, I'm such an Aquarian, I can never let things go. So we'll have a, we'll talk and then I'll say, remember when you did this, this and this and this, and back in 1985 you did this. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Is that then, why you're single now? Probably. <laughs> I wonder what people over in her part of England think of talk like a pirate day. So just as Robert Newton inadvertently influenced the mainstream American understanding of what a pirate sounds like, I wanted to close out this video with a couple of other examples of celebrity impersonations that have evolved into what we could describe as exclusively pop culture accents, which is to say styles of speaking that you will never encounter in real life, but are nevertheless highly familiar ways of infusing a certain sort of personality into a fictional character. A key example would be impressions of Peter Lorre, who was a character actor in the 1930s and 40s known for his somewhat unsettling voice. And you weren't killed? For a long time, no one was sure. Even though Peter Lorre is increasingly forgotten these days, impersonations of his distinctive voice remain popular to use for creepy characters, particularly characters associated with the undead in some way. A lot of people would probably think of this as like the Igor type accent, given it is very popular with Igor type characters. To reach full power, we need not only your master crystal, but also the remaining 25 slave crystals. I can't bring people back from the dead. It's not a pretty picture. I don't like doing it! Master! The plan! Ed Wynn was a very flamboyant comedian, also popular in the 30s and 40s, who had a very distinctive hammy way of speaking. Fate she married the Earl of Kensington in London, and 500 miles north of London she married the Earl of Gloucester, and 500 miles west of there she married another Earl. <laughs> Thank goodness she changed the Earl every 500 miles. <laughs> he later did some work as a voice actor, with his most famous role being the Mad Hatter in Walt Disney's Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> My goodness. We'll have to look into this. <laughs> Aha! I see what's wrong with it. Why, this watch is full of wheels. And since then, there has been a trend of actors doing a similar sort of flamboyant voice for goofy characters who have a couple of screws loose. Is that a threat I smell? You are beyond the... Halitosis you so obviously suffer from. I've got something for you, a metal shoe. Don't you know, you might stub your toe. I'm Dr. Weirdly, and welcome to my bizarratorium. Here, you'll find curios of the odd and peculiar. 
And lastly, a more modern celebrity impersonation that has sort of taken off and become its own thing would be the Jack Nicholson voice. He is getting pretty up in years now, but at one time he was very much Hollywood's go-to guy for playing sly or conniving characters. You want me to hold the chicken, huh? I want you to hold it between your knees. Nicholson grew up in New Jersey and has a bit of an accent, although not a stereotypical one. But through countless impersonations and imitations, an exaggerated version of his distinctive way of speaking has now become a sort of pop culture accent unto itself, frequently used for really sneaky, sometimes borderline sociopathic characters with a bit of a cool edge. You can do what you like. We're not gonna give up hope. That's real touching, Toaster. You're gonna get me ballin' like a baby any time now. Say, Jack, how'd you like a nice juicy chipmunk sandwich for a change? You know me, just your average hungry little devil. <laughs> oh, I see. The pink mosquito wears the pants in this family. Fine, I'm taking it to the street. So, parting question for you, can you give me some more specific character examples of the different accents and voices that we've talked about today? I would really like to make a comprehensive list of some of the best instances of an accent being used to infuse a very particular personality into a character, but unfortunately I just don't consume enough pop culture stuff these days, so my frames of reference can be a little limited or Dated. I would also be curious to know if you guys have any other good examples of the whole celebrity impersonation slowly mutating into generic pop culture accent phenomenon. I feel like this might be a rich enough topic to deserve its own video someday. But anyway, help me out in the comments below, and I will see you next week. <laughs>